Recording in progress. Perfect. So let's get started. It's a great honor to welcome you to the last colloquium this summer. And our speaker, Ken Zurgator from UCSD. Many of you will know him. Just a very brief introduction. Ken was his first year in summer and Harvard, and then postdoc at Rutgers and then then Western at UCSD. Um, Ken is known for a lot of things, including design for super symmetry field theories, or super control field theories, um, and so the trailblazer for duality in such theories uh, in various dimensions from three, four, five to six dimensions. And in the past years, has been sort of the leader in developing symmetry structures in super symmetry field theories, super control field theories, which is the topic of the workshop that many of you uh, are part of uh, on generalized symmetries in quantum field theories. So Ken will uh, give an overview of the topic, so please please Ken. Thank you, Sakura, for very nice oh, generous mm -hmm. introduction. There was supposed to be a fun fact about Ken. <laughs> Many of you don't actually submit to have TH. I must be manual. So most of you submit to have TH. We are all highly indebted to Ken because for many, many years he's been looking at all of our submissions, making sure the quality of the is actually spot on. Thank you, Sticker. I'm not I'm not sure if that's a fun fact, but uh, <laughs> okay. Well. Thank you all for coming and thank you for the colloquium committee for inviting me. Um, I, I thought it would be uh, oh, I see I have to how on this thing. Okay. No, no, it's okay. All right. So, thank you all for coming. Uh, I so QFT stands for quantum field theory, and everyone in this room knows that. But I thought it would be more uh, fun, at least for me, to give a very introductory talk about quantum field theory, normalization group flows, and connections and symmetries. I mean, every, everyone at the three workshops here are working with quantum field theories in one way or another, but we all come to quantum field theory from different angles, some from mathematics, and there are also some people who might be watching this online. I thought I would just uh, end up with some very pedagogical things. And the aspects of symmetry part of the title is borrowed from Cindy Coleman's book, uh, based on Eriche lectures from the late 60s through the 70s. And it's still a classic introduction to these topics in quantum field theory, Symmetry was an organizing theme of quantum field theory then and still is now. And Coleman is a pioneer of what we call HEPTH style quantum field theory, which I'll call exploratory quantum field theory. So our Aspen uh, Center for Physics workshop is on higher symmetry in quantum field theory. And I'm also part of the Simons collaboration on global categorical symmetries. And so I highlighted here um, higher and categorical wanted to explain that a little bit more. So this is the kind of newer elements of going beyond group theory. So traditional symmetries are groups, and these higher symmetries or categorical symmetries arise via higher dimensional defect operators on field theory. So I thought I'd start off with space-time symmetries. We know from special relativity that the symmetry of flat space-time is the Poincaré group. Here I wrote it in D dimensions also as a reminder of what I mean by D. So D is the space-time dimension or observed space-time dimension is four. And the Poincaré group has the translations which give us conservation of energy and momentum and also the rotations and boosts. And these Lorentz boost symmetries were first found in the context of Maxwell's equations. And then it was realized by Einstein that there was a clash, well, I didn't think about it in terms of the symmetries, but thought about it in terms of finding flashlights on trains. 
Uh, but basically those paradoxes were because of the clash between the wrong Galilean boost symmetry of pre-Einstein Newtonian physics versus the boost symmetry of Maxwell's equations. And Einstein resolved that clash by uh, special relativity, which says that actually the Lorentz boost symmetry also applies everywhere to the symmetry of space-time. All of physics should be consistent with Lorentz boost symmetry. Now, making gravity relativistic required uh, conceptually new ideas of general relativity. And in that context, the global Poincaré symmetry is a global remnant of a local general coordinate transformation. And so in, in order to do that, you need a new element, which is the dynamical metric field of spin two. And that introduces complications in, in quantum theory as well as more gravity the rest of this. Um, you can still talk about quantum field theory on fixed non-flat metrics in the rigid limit. So we're not limited to flat space. We can consider quantum field theory as any manifold that we like, but I won't be considering the, the metric as being fluctuating. Now, just as in uh, gravity, making quantum mechanics relativistic also requires something conceptually new. It wasn't, it's not just a small change. The conceptually new idea is that particles actually aren't fundamental. So instead, they're ripples of quantum fields. We can ask, what is quantum field theory? And this is actually the title of a beautiful colloquium by Nadi Seiberg on YouTube. The idea is that everything, including us, is ripples of quantum fields. And quantum field theory is an upgraded V2 of quantum mechanics. In fact, we could think about quantum mechanics as quantum field theory in one time dimension. Because in quantum mechanics, we write the positions as functions of time. We quantize the positions. We don't quantize time. And that's like what you would do in the quantum field theory in one time dimension. As I mentioned, quantum field theory is required by special relativity. For example, in, in four space-time dimensions, we can have operators which are functions of t, x, y, and z. Like in quantum mechanics, now x, y, and z aren't operators, but they're just analogous to time. And there are also higher extended higher dimensional operators. So quantum field theory applies all over the place. It applies to what we call particle physics, even though the, the particles aren't a fundamental thing, but they're ripples of fields. It applies to uh, cosmology and inflation. It also implies in non-relativistic contexts, like in materials and mm -hmm. matter physics, like CS theory is an example of a quantum field theory. And they're deep synergistic interconnections with mathematics. The key aspect that I wanted to discuss a bit more in this, in this uh, talk is that of renormalization group. So we'll often write RG, which means renormalization group. Uh, quantum field theory was developed in patches over many generations, usually focusing on some specific application. And the ideas and methods discovered in one patch could then be useful uh, in another patch. And it's fruitful to explore quantum field theories phenomena. Okay, so quantum fields allow for non-fixed numbers of particles. So like this picture of a particle collision from an accelerator, we can have two particles coming in, and many particles coming out. It doesn't make sense to talk about conserve probabilities for a single particle when there are many particles, when particle number can change. And so what happens is that all of the particles that we know, the Higgs, the electron, the photon, the gluon fields, the, the things that make up us and everything around us are all actually uh, related to corresponding fields. So there's an electron field, a photon field, gluon field, which create the particles and also the antiparticles. So we have these quantum fields, which as in quantum mechanics are operators on a Hilbert space. Or another way to describe it is Feynman's path integral where amplitudes are obtained by an integral over all field configurations. This is usually called the partition function or functional, where this J are some sources or background fields. And we integrate over the fields weighted by e to the i action or h bar. And it's, it's a little confusing to call it a partition function because actually we, we always take the absolute value squared um, to do probabilities. And so I really loved the Feynman path integral and wanted to thank Feynman for it. Uh, also, I was lucky as a high schooler to attend some public lectures that Feynman gave um, at UCLA. And 
it was really just so mind blowing. These lectures, it was shocking. I was just, it really uh, it was like a phase change for me. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if what he was saying really made sense or could possibly be true. Uh, what what he said was, for instance, uh, and the thing that I really liked about his lectures that really resonated with me was that he wasn't presenting himself as some kind of authority, and this is the way it is. And instead, it was more emphasizing the weirdness of it all that so that he didn't understand it himself. And um, what what he said in the context of particles is that if I take something like this piece of chalk and throw it up and try to catch it, well, classically we can. Uh, what this f is is some kind of parabola if we want it as a function of time. But according to Feynman, it actually takes every possible path. It, it even goes around the moon or something. And all of these different paths interfere with each other. And the one that we see is just the one that's left over after this interference pattern. We add up this e to the i. Oops. Add up this e to the i action over h bar. Okay, so I, I watched a little bit of his um, lectures recently on YouTube, not the ones that I went to, but it was from somewhere else and I did something that he said. So I won't try to do a, a good imitation of Feynman, but they, what he said was, and he's moving his arms around like this, you add these arrows and they're spinning around like a clock, round and round, round like a roulette wheel, or spinning away. You add the arrows all together with the tail of one at the head of the other. And the sum gives you the probability. That's the answer, predictable by this little game. That's a shocker, right? You say he's going to explain it, but that's exactly what I'm not going to explain. I don't understand it, the way that it works. So for me, this, this mystery was so fascinating and I'm still fascinated by it now. Um, there's magic or mystery of quantum mechanics and, and also quantum field theory because of the unseen Hilbert space, which, so it, in the mechanics, we have some state, which could be a super, superposition of different states, like the alive and Ed cat of Schrodinger's equation. And we don't directly see the state in the Hilbert space, but it nevertheless has important consequences. So nature rules the dice, um, and we, we can see what the outcome is with some probability. Or in terms of the path integral, there's this mystery magic hidden here in this integral over all of the different fields. In fact, even trying to define this mathematically is confusing, which may be part of why it's so interesting and mysterious. Okay, so we could think of quantum field theory as some kind of mystery machine where we could input the, some model, maybe some Lagrangian or some other description of the quantum field theory. We put it into the machine that we know. Uh, well, sorry, I wanted to say that we, we don't really know, but we know a bit about it. And there's a dial on the machine, which is the renormalization group energy, which I'll come back to. And then there's some output observables like an S matrix, um, maybe some phases that, that are surprising, something else like conformal field theory, there could be solitons and defects. And at weak coupling, we have some idea about what the machine does. And away from weak coupling, the output can be very surprising, not at all obvious from the input. This is some justification for, what I'd like to call exploratory quantum field theory, where we could try out various different inputs, by models, dimensions, and symmetries, and stress test the machine, and then see what comes out. So we can find interesting outputs and insights and methods by this kind of playing around. And, and often, these things that start off as toy models end up being very useful for something practical in the real world. So this is kind of like Wigner's unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, but it also applies to quantum field theory. And, uh, for our workshop here, there are many people who come to quantum field theory from math, and um, part of what, what, what they do is to try to better formulate what this machine actually is. So we heard a, a talk yesterday, for example, by Mayoko Moshita on um, quantum field theory as a functor from this input to output and discussing what the inputs and the outputs could be. And just as an inspirational story, I, I hope this story is actually true. Um, there's this thing called the One Laptop Per Child Project, which donated many solar powered laptop tablets in a remote village, which was so remote that the kids had never seen any written words or used any machines. They dropped off the laptops in the packaging with no instructions and just waited to see what the kids did with them. 
And within five days, they were using, this is quoting the MIT professor who's the CEO of the company. Within five days, they were using 47 apps per child per day. Within two weeks, they were singing ABC songs in the village. With five months, they had hacked Android. So, you know, just, just like uh, kids learn, learn language by this trial and error, you can also learn to use computers by this trial and error. And in a way, it's a little bit like this with quantum field theory. Quantum field theory also didn't come with instructions. We're still learning all of the things that the quantum theory machine can do. Okay, so we are, are actually ourselves a quantum field theory, where quantum field theories and for space time dimensions. And part of the story is described by the standard model for quarks and leptons and Higgs and the gauge fields, it's summarized here on this CERN mug. So the action for nature, part of the action for nature is the standard model Lagrangian, which is etched here, uh, the space-time metric. There's the Einstein-Hilbert part for gravity and we determined is that we don't yet know is beyond the standard model, which are the topic of, of one of the other workshops. The forces come from local um, gauge symmetries, which are local versions of this of symmetries. And actually gauge transformations are an unobservable redundancy. So it's not actually a symmetry, it's uh, more of a redundancy of a description. But anyway, the standard model illustrates the confined Higgs Coulomb phases of gauge theories. The gauge theories can have these different phases. There's the strong force, which is SU3 color, which in the infrared is confined. This is an unclaimed million dollar clay price problem to this confinement. And then SU2 weak and U1 uh, hypercharge are, are broken down to a subgroup, which is electromagnetism. This is the Higgs phase. Electromagnetism is in the Coulomb phase. So there are these different phases. And as an aside, the standard model gauge group is actually this thing divided by some discrete subgroup, which is a, a subgroup of Z6. And I wrote to be determined because we don't yet know what subgroup of Z6 it actually is. And this discrete part affects the spectrum of possible line operators, which was discussed in a very nice paper by David Tong some years ago. Okay, so a big part of the story are the normalization group flows, which is like zooming out from the UV to the IR. We can think of the renormalization group flows as like flows of streams of water down a landscape. Here, there's this is some picture of flows of streams that are converging. And universality is the notion that these different streams tend to converge into different basins of attraction. So if we plot renormalization group flow, we start off in the ultraviolet from some theory. This is like some input to a machine. And it could be some cutoff theory or conformal field theory. And then there are some relevant operators, which in terms of this game that some of you might have played as a, as a kid, if you're old enough, uh, shoots and ladders. Um, these relevant operators are like the shoots here, which bring you down. And then the renormalization group flow is coarse graining, it's described by Wilson, which is like zooming out. We take our space-time coordinates and we multiply them by a scale transformation, is lambda. And we do the scale transformation in this lambda so that we're, we're zooming out. So zooming out means you, you start at short distances, which is the ultraviolet, and you go to long distances, which is the infrared. And then the question is, what happens in the infrared? Is it a gap theory, like in this million dollar clay price problem? Is it a conformal field theory? If you flow into this infrared endpoint, this is like the endpoint of these flows into some lake or something, if it goes along some direction, which is some irrelevant operator. And these are like ladders. So in terms of this game, these ladders are ways that you could, you see them are that ways that you could try to climb up to higher energies. So for example, um, standard model is a great description of nature, but LHG is now looking for dimension six, um, standard model effective field theory operators, which could be some clue, some ladder to climb up to higher energies. And to figure out what happens at shorter distance. And Higgs mass is like a shoot because we have to fine tune it. Otherwise, relevant mm -hmm. operator, otherwise it'll go to large values and be something that it's, we don't like. Okay, so this is an, another picture of the renormalization group flows, which are verging by universality. So this, we can have some UV starting point one, 
the UV starting point too. Universality is the idea that these things could converge to one infrared fixed point. And in some cases, this universality is very interesting. We call it duality, where the infrared point might look very different than the ultraviolet starting point. So there could be, um, these two theories also could look very different from each other. It's called a duality if there's some non-trivial map here. And then there could be some mountain in field space, which is blocking these different streams from some other stream. And then that other stream is some other ultraviolet point, which might go to some different infrared fixed point. And so again, the interesting question is what happens in the infrared? Is it free, gap, topological, quantum field theory, thermal field theory? Usually we can't follow these flows directly, directly as perturbation theory quickly becomes unreliable. And there are very few non-perturbative tools. One tool is to do it numerically by putting the theory on a lattice. And the other tools are, based, are mostly based on symmetries. So a better understanding of symmetries is leading to better constraints. And sometimes it's possible to rule out some infrared scenarios like symmetry preserving gap phases using constraints from anomalies and anomaly matching. So this is something that I'll discuss most too. Okay, so, so just to say a few, a few words about the renormalization group and kind of compare and contrast quantum electrodynamics with quantum chromodynamics. So quantum electrodynamics is the theory of the um, electron and the photon. And so the photon is described by a U1 gauge theory. And U1 is an abelian gauge group. The group elements commute with each other. And the consequence of that is the photon is electrically neutral. And so if we have some charge, this charge can pop out as it's uh, positrons and electrons from the vacuum, polarizes the vacuum. And the effect of that is that as you go farther and farther away from the charge, the charge is more and more screened by the vacuum. And the upshot is that the infrared theory is weakly coupled. So quantum electrodynamics is a theory that's infrared free. And if you do the opposite and go to the ultraviolet, then there's kind of a question mark about what happens in the ultraviolet with 3D. In, in the infrared, it's possible to make incredibly precise predictions like the G uh, gyro magnetic ratio for the electron is predicted to some huge number of digits and it could be experimentally confirmed to a huge number of digits. It's the best tested theory in all of science. So even though quantum field theory is weird, it, it can make these incredibly precise predictions that we know it's right. On the other hand, for actually, maybe I'll uh, coming back to the ultraviolet. Ultraviolet um, is ambiguous anyway. So experiment is needed to tell us what happens in the ultraviolet. There's for, for quite a while people worried about the ultraviolet since the 1950s because there's what's called a Landau pole, which is that if you want to either the, the coupling constant blows up in the ultraviolet or it's zero in the infrared. But um, Lando pole is ridiculously far in the ultraviolet, and so there's no solid ladder anyway to guess. All sorts of things could cure this problem, like grand unification or string theory or who knows what. And so it, it's kind of not really a problem that we need to worry about. If we look at, uh, on the other hand, at quantum chromodynamics, which is the strong force, there, the gauge group is this SU3 color, which is a non-abelian gauge group. The different group elements don't commute with each other. And this fact that the group elements don't commute with each other means that the force carriers, which are the gluons, are themselves charged under the force. So it leads to a nonlinear behavior of the force. And the upshot of that is that there's charge anti-screening from the spin one gluons. So it's exactly the opposite of QED. The ultraviolet can be weak, it's asymptotic freedom, that's what's plotted here. As you go towards higher energies, the analog of the fine structure constant goes down. So it becomes weakly coupled in the far ultraviolet, despite being called the strong force, it's weakly coupled in the ultraviolet. And in the infrared, it's strong. It's challenging to determine what happens in the infrared. But unlike this case, it's not ambiguous. You know the ultraviolet starting point, we should be able to figure out the infrared point, even though we don't know exactly how to do it. So this is the challenge of strongly coupled theories. It's a challenge to find the output and symmetries can help. 
Okay, so for fun and for a break, I thought I would teach you all a magic trick. Um, I thought about doing this as a demonstration, but I and I got worried that it would take too long and maybe not be interesting. But this is a magic trick based on um, we call it the Martin Kruskal counts. This is the same Kruskal from solitons and Kruskal coordinates for a black hole. And so the effect of the magic trick is you can ask your friend to think of any integer from one to 10. And then you explain to them some procedures, you show them some cards. I actually brought a deck of cards so that if anyone's interested, we could do this afterwards. Um, you show them some cards and then at the end of, of going through the, showing all the decks, the cards in the deck, they end up with some card and then you miraculously name that card. And so if they don't know about the renormalization group, they'll, they might think somehow you read their mind and knew what number from one to 10 they thought of. But actually it doesn't matter what number from one to 10 they thought of because all of these 10 different choices are like 10 different renormalization groups streams that eventually converge the same six lines. Yeah. And so you can name their card even though you didn't actually know what their number was. And so the method to this is that you secretly just do exactly what they're doing. So okay. the idea that I had was we could all in this room give yeah. some number from one to 10, and then we can raise our hands when it's hard and yeah. Yeah, it starts to converge. But you just do the same thing too. And eventually you'll get the same card as they do by universality. All of the 10 dreams eventually converge to the same basin of attraction. The initial integer is ambiguous and irrelevant anyway. This is like the UV limit of BD where it's kind of ambiguous. It's irrelevant as far as we're concerned. The procedure of this Pascal count is that uh, you show cards from a deck and you tell the people to mentally count down. Every time I show a card, mentally count down from your number. So you'll, you'll ignore the cards as I'm showing the different cards, but counting down from your number until you get to zero. And when you get to zero, that's going to be your key card and with your first key card. And when you see your first key card, you immediately reset your number to that card's value. And so for instance, like an ace would be one, a two would be two, and then all the way up to 10. If it's a, if it's a jack, queen, or king, maybe just make it a five to make the thing converge a little bit faster. And then starting with that card, you do the same thing again with the same rules. And eventually after enough of these steps, everyone will, will converge to the same thing. So if people are interested, we could try it out afterwards. Okay, so just to wrap up, what is we can ask what is quantum field theory? Well, we come to we all come to quantum field theory from maybe different angles, and we might think of it in, in different ways. Uh, we look at it from perturbation theory around free field Lagrangians. It looks like one thing. From other directions, of it might look like something else, and it's a rich space full of surprises, interconnections by RG flows. And the novel frontiers lead to a deeper understanding of quantum field theory. Symmetries, when present, give additional tools. Okay, so what is symmetry? Well, we see examples of symmetry in everyday life, like we see this big ball, which is here. And uh, we have experiences physicists of its power and limitations. For example, symmetric solutions can optimize things. Um, one example is sphere packing. If you in the case of two dimensions and three dimensions, this was actually considered by Kepler in the 1600s who conjectured that it's optimized by hexagons. And in four, five, six, and seven dimensions, it's not known what optimizes it, I think. But in eight dimensions, it turns out to be the E8 symmetry group lattice. And the, the, there were 2016 proofs of this by Marina Yazovska. Um, of Ukrainian origin and won the um, peace medal this year. Okay, one thing that we see often in quantum field theory is that symmetry can be um, approximate and enhanced at long distances. In quantum field theory, we call these accidental symmetries. So if you look at the earth as a spherical symmetry, but if you zoom in, you don't see that spherical symmetry anymore. So here we would say that there's no symmetry in the ultraviolet. And, but if you zoom out, you can have an emergent or accidental symmetry in the infrared. And again, this is often seen in renormalization group flows 
the universality. And some examples of that are the infrared theory can have a scale invariance or it could be conformal invariance, or it could be gapped with topological entries in the deep infrared. So it's, and, and often, by the way, some of these enhanced axonal symmetries are things like exceptional symmetries, like, like this new symmetry. Okay, so I wanted to talk about uh, some reinterpretation of Noether's theorem, just to remind you about Noether's theorem. Uh, continuous symmetries can give conserved currents. So yeah. There's a, a symmetry, there's, you know, write down these conservation laws, there's a conserved charge that you integrate by, you get by integrating the component of the current over space. And this applies for electric charge, energy, momentum, angular momentum. It also applies approximately to approximately conserved symmetry, like the Marion number, for instance, which can come from approximate low symmetries. So let's rewrite, rewrite though there's conserved charge this way. So here, this notation is, um, it's a charge, which I'll think of as a zero form. Zero form means it's a scalar, as opposed to something like a energy or momentum or angular momentum. And we get this zero form charge integrating over a d minus one dimensional space, for instance, this space, which is like some place in space time. So instead of calling it a d minus one dimensional space, I'll call it a co dimension one space because that's one transverse direction. And we can write it in this mathematical way in terms of the Hodge star of a one form. And it turns out that this thing that's being integrated is topological. So even though it might not be obvious from writing it this way, there's no metric dependence. And the fact that there's no metric dependence is why it's a conserved charge. So we could kind of move this surface around and the charge will be conserved. So th this was um, emphasized in this paper by Kyoto, Kapusta, and Cyborg and Willett from some years ago, where we could think about symmetries in terms of topological defect operator. So what I wrote on the last slide was an example of a topological defect operator. And the, the basic things that we have is that we think of traditionally in quantum field theory are operators at points. Like for instance, the base that we can make from our basic fields those are operators at points. Because those are operators at points in space time, the point is, is zero dimensional. So these are zero dimensional operators. And they might be in some representation of the symmetry group, like the mesons or something might be in some representation of the flavor group. And then there's a co-dimension one topological defect operator that's labeled by each group element G, which acts on the operator giving some unitary transformation. So since we, we have these operators that are acting in Hilbert space and we wanna preserve probabilities, it's some unitary transformation and for example, if, it, if it's a U1 symmetry, you could write the group element as e to the i alpha, and then the transformation will be this e to the i alpha times this corresponding charge, which we get by integrating for some surface, dimension one surface. So just to draw some pictures, this is the operator O, and this dot in the middle is the space-time point where it is. This is the topological defect operator associated with the group element G, if we pull it up, the operator what happens is it goes through the operator, but then part of it gets stuck, wrapping around the operator. And this part that wraps around the operator just gives a phase times the operator. That's how this measures the charge of the operator. Once, once it's rephrased this way, then the natural generalization, which was discussed in, in this paper by these authors, um, in terms of generalized symmetries. Instead of just talking about operators at points, we could talk about other dimensional operators like line operators or surface operators. And then we can ask about, about their symmetries. An operator of some space-time dimension P, like P is zero, it's a point operator. If P equals one, it, it'd be a curve operator. Um, it can also carry charges. It can have p-form symmetry charges, which are measured by co-dimension p plus one topological defect operators, labeled by the group element. So here, this is the same kind of picture that I drew before. This is some charged operator of space-time dimension p. I drew it as a point, but you can imagine that into the board there are p dimensions, 
And then there's this, then we can surround it by the topological defect operator, which has co-dimension e plus one. This is, allows us to surround it with some radial direction at plus one. And then in the same way, it could just give a phase or, or some other depend some other unitary transformation depending on uh, the representation. For P equals to zero, we know the symmetry groups could be abelian or non-abelian. And so that's because P equals zero means co-dimension one. And so if we have two dimension one topological op effect operators, G and H, the only way to exchange them is to bring them through each other. And so then we don't have to get the same answer anymore. On the other hand, if, it, if P is bigger than zero, so like for instance, here this G and H going into the board, there's like the dimension two in the plane that we see. Um, now we can move them around each other, not necessarily a billion group. So if P is bigger than zero, it's a billion. Okay, so P equals zero are the symmetries that we know from, um, long ago. And P equals one, for instance, is something new. These are the large objects are line or curve operators we can carry this, uh, what we would call a one form global symmetry. So to give an example, if we look at just good old U1 Maxwell theory, so just look at the Maxwell's equations, here Maxwell's equations are written in this fancy notation to, um, try to emphasize the connection to this notation with forms. So this is the, the statement of no magnetic charge. And this is the statement usually that the F2 is F mu. This is the statement that there could be, well, there could be, there could have been electric charges here on the right hand side. But I'm assuming that this is just pure Maxwell theory without any electric charges. So in that case, you get these two equations for Maxwell's equations, and each one of them ends up applying a uh, symmetry. So th this first one here applies a symmetry, which is U1 electric one form symmetry. This would be broken if we had electrically charged matter. And then the second one is a magnetic symmetry, which in E space time dimensions would be a D minus three form symmetry. Um, so for example, in three dimensions, this would just be a zero form symmetry, which is an ordinary symmetry. And that case was discussed um, since the 19, late 1970s. Right. So we could also do it in four dimensions, then it's a one form symmetry. And, and this is conserved as long as there's no magnetic, uh, no dynamical magnetic mono, fundamental dynamical monopoles. Anyway, so we have charged operators, which are electric Wilson lines or magnetic lines or surface operators. And there's an analog of this also for SUN Yang Mills theory. This is the theory we like to uh, show confinement. And this theory has a, a global DN one form symmetry, Wilson lines, and the charges are mentioned, measured by some surface operator, topological defect operators. Okay, so I just wanted to briefly remind you about Landau symmetry breaking area phase transitions, we'd like to distinguish, for instance, different phases in quantum field theory. And one way that we know that that's done in materials is through Landau's um, description in terms of, of symmetry breaking, this transition. By the way, Landau's famous paper or original paper on this from 1937 was written at the Ukrainian Zico Technical Institute in Kharkov. Um, so the idea there is that symmetry we could, for instance, distinguish the, the solid phase of materials like water, um, the liquid or the vapor phases, because the solid phase, something different happens. The yeah. symmetry is broken. Translations and rotational symmetries are broken. So there, there's, there's an actual phase transition between that phase and the phases with unbroken symmetry. So phases with unbroken symmetry are the liquid or the gas phase. And there doesn't have to be a transition between the liquid or, or the gas phase in, in general, there isn't because they have the same symmetry. So a way to distinguish different phases is they have different symmetries that are preserved versus broken. And actually at this point here, at the end of this uh, separator between these phases is another enhanced symmetry. This is the theory here 
vector has a continuous phase transition, it's a fixed point of the renormalization group. It's, it has an enhanced symmetry, which is actually a conformal symmetry. And for instance, it could be the 3D seen or Wilson Fisher fixed point. Okay, so, so this is some picture of the different phases. In the unbroken phase, there's something where the order parameter for breaking the symmetry is at the origin. So the symmetry is unbroken. And there could be a phase transition. And then there could be a phase where the symmetry is broken, but the order parameter is away from the origin. And this also happens for continuous symmetries, like in this in bottle potential. And so in this case, we call this spontaneous symmetry breaking. And this applies also for generalized symmetries. So for example, the massless photon uh, can be thought of as the nambu goldstein boson for spontaneous symmetry breaking of these U1 global symmetries that I mentioned. So the fact that it's massless, it's related to the fact that it's a, a goldstein boson, these symmetries. And that's a way to distinguish the Coulomb phase from the other phases. So in the Coulomb phase, we have deconfined Wilson lines, um, and these symmetries are spontaneously broken. And firstly, we could prove that SUN Yang Mills has confinement. This is the Clay Price problem. If we can prove that its global symmetry is not spontaneously broken, because ZN one form symmetry is unbroken. This is a 4D version of the Polyakov loop. Okay, so I wanted to briefly discuss symmetries and group theory in the language of um, in the language of category theory to, to describe what categorical symmetries are. So a group G we can think of as a collection of morphisms. These are just the group operations, like for instance the rotations of a Rubik's cube. So these are the morphisms. Then there's a composition rule to combine products of them to create a new morphism. With the requirements that it's associative, it's a unique identity, and every morphism has a unique inverse. So if you look at, for instance, the Rubik's cube group, these are the groups of different things that you can rotate a Rubik's cube. It has this number of elements. This is the number of different configurations of a Rubik's cube. It's a non-abelian group. Uh, even though it has this huge number of different elements, it takes at most 20 moves to get to the identity element. Okay, so if we think about it as a category, a group is a case of a category with just one object, which is like the system, and then the morphisms that, that act on the system. So in the case of the Rubik's cube, you have one object, which is, which is the Rubik's cube, and then these morphisms take the Rubik's cube back to the Rubik's cube. It might be in a different, it looks like a different configuration, but it's the same Rubik's cube. And so we could combine these with the group law and there are recent quantum field theory examples with generalized symmetries that go beyond group theory or generalized categories. For more generalized categories, we need something more than just one object, perhaps an object. So one example of that is a groupoid where we, we have two objects. So one way to have two objects is to smash the Rubik's cube, a bunch of pieces. So now we have two objects, which is the whole Rubik's cube and the smash Rubik's cube. And we have these transformations like the Rubik's group elements or the breaking it, or the reassembling it or permuting the pieces. These are all different things that we can do to these two elements. And in this case of a groupoid, everything has an inverse, but not every multiplication makes sense. For instance, if you, if you break it and you have a bunch of pieces, and if you permute the pieces and try to reassemble it, you might get something that's not a valid cube anymore. And so then we would say that that composition doesn't really make sense. So this is this is what's called a groupoid. Um, another thing that we could do is we could start off with just something with two system, with just one system like the Rubik's cube. You could look at the morphisms that we talked about before, and then we could look at morphisms between those morphisms. And so this gives what we could call a two group. Uh, the two group could be described in terms of some zero form group, which could be non abelian, uh, some one form group associated with these morphisms of morphisms, some extra data, including something called the Postnikov class that I'll come back to. And physical realizations have been found in the, this in quantum field theories 
including theories similar to 4D QED. This Postnikov class comes from mid-hooked anomalies. Okay, there are also more general categorical symmetries, like for instance, we could take the Rubik's cube and we can light it on fire. Um, I didn't actually take this picture. You could Google Rubik's cube on fire and there it is. <laughs> um, you can write, light the Rubik's cube on fire. And then in that case, there's not an inverse. Once you've lit it, lit it on fire, you can't go back to this thing or to that thing. So this would be a more general categorical symmetry where every element has an inverse. And examples of this have also been found in quantum theory. Um, in fact, um, these non-invertible symmetries were found in two-dimensional examples um, by these authors, um, one of the authors is here in the audience. And the way that this can arise in 2D examples is that you can have a, a two-dimensional quantum field theory which lives on the slab, which lives on the boundary of some 3D slab. So there's this 3D slab and there's a chiral theory living on the left side. There's an anti-chiral theory living on the right side. And, but, but there's also stuff inside of the slab. And inside of the slab, you can have line operators, which are like these topological effect yeah. operators associated with symmetries. And if the line operator connects the two sides of the slab, a 2D perspective, this is like a point operator. It has both a Z and a Z bar because it connects both the Z side on the left side of the slab the Z bar on the right side of the slab. But you can also have those same line operators that are configured this way. And from the 3D or from the 2D point of view, these are topological defect operators. And they have fusion rules, which are like analogs of the operator product expansion fusion rules. Yeah. So they can have these kinds of fusion rules where two of them fuse together to give other ones. So for example, in the 2D uh, Easing model, there's a topological defect operator that I'll call N for non-invertible. And if you multiply it by itself, it gives one plus another line operator. This other line operator is the line operator associated with the, with the Z2 symmetry of the Easing theory. So the fact that it's not just one, but one plus something else means it's non-invertible. And so the way that that shows up is for instance, if you take this line operator and if you try to pull it through one of the operators in the theory, the spin operator doesn't just a phase, but it gets stuck on it because this n times n could give eta. So here's n and n giving eta, and this eta connects to some other operator, order operator. This, this is an example of this non-invertible symmetry. Okay, so time is quickly running out, but so I wanted to discuss anomalies um, and the hoofed anomalies. So part of the magic of, of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory is that the overall, we don't directly observe states in Hilbert space. And one of the ways that we don't directly observe it is we only see the absolute value squared of them. And so you can give them an unobservable phase and because the probabilities are only absolute value squares. And this unobservable phase, we, we see it in various contexts, like for instance, in ENM, if we do a gauge transformation of the gauge fields, this should be unphysical, it should be unobservable. But if we do that on a charged state, it can give an, a phase related to the charge. And then we just say, okay, this is not gauge invariant. And so this is, a, this is an unobservable phase that we'll actually see. Uh, if, in terms of probabilities, we won't see it anyway because we'll take absolute value squares. Well, symmetry has what's called a quantum anomaly if the vacuum amplitude picks up a non-trivial phase, there's such a symmetry operation. And these anomalies have been a guiding light for quantum field theory development since the late 1960s. They're discussed a lot in Coleman's book and continuing to the present. The original anomaly was what's called the ABJ anomaly for Adler, Bell, and Jakeef. And this, um, this was called an anomaly because it's associated with the decay of the pi zero to photons. At the time when it was observed, it was very strange. And so people called that an anomaly. Then they eventually realized that, Adler, Bell, and Jakeef realized that this anomaly is related to a broken symmetry. There's a, a classical symmetry which forbids this decay, which is broken by quantum effects. And so the way that it's broken by quantum effects is that you have some virtual charged fermions which run around in the loop 
and they couple to the gauge fields, could be the photon or the gluon or the W bosons, and that can violate this, this classically conserved symmetry. You could write it this way, where the right-hand side of here would have been zero if it were a good symmetry, where the symmetry is broken by this anomaly. And the way that it's broken is there's some coefficient that's alpha, it's just some number that we could compute in this, in this triangle diagram, times the involving the gauge fields, which is topological. It's the second churn class. Or if there are U1 gauge fields, it's the it's churn class squared. And this is actually related also to the Atiyah Singer index theorems from around the same time. And from that point of view, what happens is if we integrate this, we see that there are um, instanton configurations at fermion zero mode, we violate the symmetry. And the upshot is that the U1 class Physical symmetry is explicitly broken by instantons. And for instance, this solved what was called the U1 problem, which is that if you look at this spontaneous symmetry breaking of Gelman's SU3 flavor, this is the eightfold way, then you get like pions, which form, uh, which are in the eight of the, ad the adjoint of this SU3 flavor symmetry. They look like a hexagon with the two dots in the middle. Um, but if this, Anomalous U1 had been a symmetry, there would have been a ninth, yeah, which isn't there. So this explains why there are eight light pions instead of nine. Okay, so just to summarize, the anomaly that I was just discussing, the ABJ anomaly, involves one flavor current and two gauge currents. But we could we could look at other variants of that. Instead of just one flavor current and two gauge currents, we could look at, for instance, three gauge currents or three flavor currents. Each one of these has a different interpretation. So the interpretation for the ABJ anomaly that I just mentioned, is that the global symmetry F is broken, but the theory is fine. In this case, if this thing turns out to be non-zero, then the theory is sick. And actually the only way that you can cure this, one way that you can cure this is to have an extra dimension, the inflow into an extra dimension. This was pointed out by Callan and Harvey in E5. Then we can check, like for instance, for the standard model, it's non-trivial that for each generation of the standard model, all of these age cubed anomalies end up being zeros. So for the standard model, we don't need extra, we don't need inflow into the dimension. Um, and then in the case of the Atuft anomaly, we do the same thing, but now with flavor currents, with the flavor currents. The interpretation in this case is that the flavor symmetry is unbroken because there are three of them instead of just one in this case. And the theory is fine, but it's an obstruction to gauging that flavor symmetry. Because if we wanted to gauge that flavor symmetry, it would be this case, and then the theory would be sick, or there would be inflow into an extra dimension. That turns out to be incredibly powerful, non-zero. So uh, whenever we find theories where these things are non-zero, it, it's like a wonderful gift, because then we know something about, about the theory in the infrared. These Hooft anomalies also exist for other dimensions and for discrete symmetries, and they're powerful constraints on the renormalization group flows if they're non-zero, because they have to be constant on the renormalization group flows. They can't change. This is one thing that we actually, in general, renormalization group flows are a mystery or beyond weak coupling. One thing that we know for sure is that if there are Hooft anomalies, they have to be constant on those flows. And Sometimes there are obstructions to gap phases. So then you will know that the Fred theory can have a gap phase, for instance. Sorry, can I just ask a question? Something I wonder about for 25 years. So why do they have to be constant along the Adam flows, the anomalies? Oh, okay. So, so the question was why, why do it hooked anomalies have to be constant? So actually, at Hoof's original argument was we could add some spectator fields and then gauge gauge the symmetry group and decouple the spectator fields. And, and all of that sounds like it, it might have some loopholes because maybe the spectator fields don't exactly decouple or something like that. But actually this description in terms of inflow gives a, a good insight to that because if you were to actually gauge it, you don't need a hoof spectator field. You could just have inflow to some topological theory in the extra dimension. And then that topological theory in the extra dimension can't have any dependence on the normalization group. Uh, so that thing definitely stays constant in the entire energy trajectory. Yeah, so this description in terms of inflow really cleans up the argument. Okay, so 
Okay. Um, there's been a lot of work on anomalies and chiral edge modes on boundaries of a gapped bulk. Uh, there are anomalies in D dimensions from extra dimensions. There's chiral fermions on the lattice. This is like Kaplan's description where you can have mass in an extra dimension that changes sign to get chiral fermions. Um, there are um, work from coming from the condensed matter theory community on topological insulators. This is drawing there. The important works by members of our workshop audience you can have anomaly quantum field theories on the boundary of vertebral theories. This, this is like the kind of thing I was just uh, mentioning or relative quantum field theories or sandwich theory. There's this series of papers by people in the room, including one which is maybe coming out tomorrow. Um, you could see in the paper that's coming out tomorrow, Gumby is a, a pair of chaps boredism. So look for footnote 21. So this is a, a flowering um, subfield in synergy of quantum field theory. Here I just tried to draw some kind of flower to show that there's this synergy coming from the high energy physics community, the math community, the condensed matter community. There, there are too many references to reference everyone. So I thought I would just write down some of the ones that are more than five years old. And um, this, this paper by Moore and Zyberg was, my first research paper was, was kind of following very closely. This is a paper that I, know and love. Um, and just many of these things kind of started off in the in the high energy physics community, thinking about logical quantum field theories and rational conformal field theories. And then it has connections to mathematics. And then it was returned to by the high energy physics community. And then there are these related works from the condensed matter community. I apologize for mi missing many important references. But um, well, my colleague, John McGreevy, wrote a beautiful review on generalized symmetries in condensed matter physics, which has many references. And Cordova and Thomas Dumitrescu and Ian Hang Xiao wrote a white paper on generalized symmetries in quantum field theory and beyond, which has all many references, still need to add more. Um, I wanted to maybe if there's time just to spend one slide on, on something that I did, which uh, with Cordova and Thomas Dumitrescu, which is two group symmetries from anomalies, since the time is running out, I'll, I'll just basically just flash this. We looked at something which is slightly different than the ABJ anomaly. The ABJ anomaly had one flavor current and two gauge currents. So we looked at a case where there's two flavor currents and one gauge current. Or in, in six dimensions, we could look at two flavor currents and two gauge currents. So the difference from the ABJ anomaly is the ABJ anomaly had just one flavor current. And here we have two. For the case of the ABJ anomaly, the symmetry was just broken. For this case where there are two flavor currents, um, the corresponding anomaly can be non-zero and the theory is fine. Instead of the symmetry being broken, it's deformed to a two group. So you end up with some two group coefficient, which is related to the coefficient of this anomaly. Uh, here, this is kind of just writing some things that it's two group is similar to Green Schwartz's anomaly cancellation mechanism. Green Schwartz mechanism. Uh, John Schwartz was here last week. Uh, this is discovered by Green and Schwartz here in Aspen in 1984 and that's yeah. super strange revolutions. And there's very simple examples that realize this, like just 4D QED with massless flavors, through this anomaly, which is on zero, which leads to a two group symmetry. Also, by the way, we show two group symmetry obstructs conformal symmetry. Uh, there are also discrete versions of two groups, uh, including by people in the audience and uh, some of these papers have, have a nice description of the two groups in terms of the associator of these symmetry lines. So we can look at these different symmetry lines and we can combine them in different ways and you can end up something which is this Posnikov class, which um, creates a, a co-dimension to a topological defect operator and that's related to the two group structure. Okay. Uh, one, this is the last slide, basically. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is that there are also non-invertible symmetries from the ABJ anomaly. And so, so the, you know, the ABJ anomaly is the original anomaly, tells us that we can have pi zero decay into two photons. And if we look at it, not for the case of a non-abelian theory, but for the case of a U1 gauge theory, something special happens if it's U1, which is that it's not explicitly violated by instantons. So U1 doesn't have any instantons for this UN. 
So it, it's anomaly, anomalous, but it's not explicitly violated. And then you might think you could fix it up and people tried in the past to fix it up and it didn't work. But these authors showed a way that does fix it up. At least if you make the, this phase rotation, something which is like two pi over an integer. And you can fix it up by buying it with the quantum Hall state, the, the symmetry operator. So then you get this symmetry operator, which is the thing that you would have written down if it weren't anomalous, plus the part that fixes it up. And this is non-invertible because if you multiply it, but by what would have wanted to be the inverse, you don't get the identity, but you get something called the condensation operator. This is a non-invertible axial symmetry from our good old friend, the ABJ anomaly. Just to remind you, non-invertible is this picture. Okay, so just to conclude, quantum field theory is vast. Parts of it are well-known, other parts are mysterious. There are applications to all to the areas in physics and also mathematics. Symmetries provide powerful perspectives. For exciting new developments from defect operators and generalized symmetries and applications. There's a deep and fruitful synergy with math well beyond what I uh, mentioned at a very sketchy level, for instance, the cobordism hypothesis and more. And so I'd like to thank, uh, take this opportunity to thank our workshop organizers, Constantine Telemann, Clay Cordova, Julia Plavnik, and Sakura Bernamaki. And the ACP, and thank you also to collaborators and colleagues in the Women's Foundation and the collaboration on global categorical symmetry. Perhaps. I can start off with healthy section. Where do you think are we, we need to emphasize to the top phenomenon between the symmetry and the symmetry from examples? So, where do you see the categorical symmetry, for example, have constraints on, say, LR? Yeah, yeah, this. So, the question was, um, about these generalized symmetries and straining our G flows, and that yeah. this this is this is exactly what I'd like to understand better right now. But um, question to the discussion session for tomorrow. Oh, okay. Okay, very good. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's a really interesting question, and um, the part part of, part of the goal of our collaboration was to kind of answer these kinds of questions about. Um, yeah. How to make more use of these generalized symmetries with RG flows. So um, I don't know if I have a, a good answer for what I expect. I, I think it's a very exciting area. Any other questions? No, okay, so Simon. Uh, Ken, how? How would you think uh, could could these ideas have applications for strongly coupled theories where we do not know so much about our G flow? Are there any? Do people have? Um, uh, uh, does this new take on uh, uh, symmetries offer doors which presently have, previously haven't been available, or is there? Um, direction which uh, which now becomes perhaps an interesting new line of the tech or yeah I mean it, this. in some cases it maybe gives ways to rephrase things that we might have suspected before already like um, so, uh, yeah. I, as you know from your work it's it's interesting to think about theories with non-trivial UV fixed points like right. asymptotic safety and so there was this old question of Asymptotic safety in, in QED, for instance. Um, and so one, one thing that we could see, for instance, is that um, in, in QED, we don't have this electric unformed symmetry because we have the charged uh, electron fields, but we do have the magnetic unformed symmetry. And that magnetic unformed symmetry turns out to be an obstruction to the formal symmetry. And so what we know is that 
if if there is a UV fixed point, yeah. that's uniform symmetry has to be broken. Yeah. And so it, it could be there still in the infrared as an emergent one form symmetry, but it could be an obstruction to um, to having a conformal field theory. And the way that it could be broken could be to have a genetically charged objects. And so, um, so you, you would need to have something like both massless um, electrically charged objects and massless magnetically charged objects. We actually can't write down the Lagrangian break both of these symmetries and get a conformal field theory from the P1 base theory. There are cases where that, that happens in um, equals two theories on the Plum branch where, where this actually happens. You just look at good old QED. It's, it's um, well, you need something more that, probably than just QED. Like that gets them all up in this. You mentioned this review by John McGreevy on uh, higher symmetries and infinite matter physics. Do you think in the near future there could be a similar review for applications to particle physics as well? Or is it? Um, yeah, it's a it's a huge topic. And so I think it would be great to have a good review. Our um, thing that we wrote wasn't really, it, it was more of a very short review and a large number of references, but um, yeah, it, would, it would be good to have a, a review in the context. Of how we do this. I mean, can you just give some examples of, I mean, you know, because John has these very nice applications to real condensed matter physics systems. So. Yeah, I mean, in our snow mass review, we have some, we, we try to, to highlight some of, some of the examples, but um, uh, so, so we have a review, which is kind of a, Maybe too short to be useful, but it, it has a huge number of references. But we do highlight some of the of, some of the main main things we're presenting. Anyone wants to go on? Tony, one more. Maybe a provocative thought. Uh, you left out gravity in all your considerations. Uh, is there? Um, uh, would there be potential in not doing so and applying some of your reasoning, even in, even in a... Yeah, that, I mean, this, this is a huge area where people look at um, how gravity breaks global symmetries and or it kind of ties in with a lot of things that people call like the weak gravity or small plan and all of these different kinds of things. So, so there is a huge research area devoted to these types of things. Um, I haven't worked on it, so that's why I left it out. But there is a area. But the main thing is that gravity breaks the most symmetries. And so, so that, that kind of, at first glance, is like a fly in the ointment, but then you can still say that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.